Hey everyone, Matt here from the Jamie Lewis Off-Road Riding School, and today I want to tell you about the online beginner course that we have available right now at jamielewisoffroad.com slash online courses. This is a course that you can purchase and receive lifetime access to 10 lessons and 10 drills that I use when I'm teaching beginner riders out here in Prompt, Nevada. These lessons and drills are designed to take anyone who has never touched a motorcycle before and have them riding safely and comfortably at the completion of this course. We've been developing this curriculum for quite some time, and with the feedback that we have gotten from real beginner riders, I feel comfortable in saying it is the safest and most comprehensive introduction to the sport that we all love. Now, if you've been riding for quite some time but want to help someone out who is just looking to get into the sport, you can purchase this as a gift and help give them this safe introduction. Again, this is all available at jimmylewisoffroad.com slash online courses. Now, here's the show. I'm Jimmy Lewis. And I'm Paul Neff. And this is episode six of the Better Rider podcast. And this is a podcast where we uh, tell you a little bit about the Jimmy Lewis Off-Road Riding School. And this week, we tell you about the CISPIS Off-Road Training, because that is where Paul Neff works. That's his uh, operation. And we'll give you a little insight on where Paul came from, how he got to where he's at, and what he plans on doing in the near future. So welcome, Paul, to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Yep. So in um, it may look like we've aged a little bit, or at least me, since our last one's been a little bit of time, but I put on my winter coat, as we like to say. If you're listening to this, that means I have a beard. <laughs> so been a little while. The set got a little more decorated. Um, we've been doing uh, our Tech Talk Taco Tuesday podcast a little bit more, and things are moving right along. So on this one, we focus exclusively on the school. We try to give you a little nugget at the end of the podcast where we give you some sort of a writing tip that you can work on. But more importantly on this episode, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, I would say, re-met Paul because I knew Paul from his yeah. racing and uh, and then kind of where we're at with, uh, with uh, CISPA cycles and the training that's offered up in the Pacific Northwest. So I met Paul at uh, the second time I met him really was at the tour tech rally. And when we go to a lot of these different events, uh, I will do demonstrations and stuff. And often we put on challenges and sometimes we make them relatively difficult. And there was this guy on a KTM 950 <laughs> making it look really easy, like, like way too easy. And I'm like, this guy, he's, he's got some riding skills. And I didn't, I had not, I didn't know Paul was there. Didn't know who he was, you know, there at the event. And there was this one turn that we specifically designed to be a very tight radius on an off-camber hill. And if you know anything about a KTM 950, it does not have a very good turning radius. And so it was probably right. I did it on a KTM 1090 and it was right at the limit of what that had done. So you would have to do this crazy maneuver where you're going to have to do a little bit of a brake slide on an uphill off-camber to be able to drop down and not go outside the cones. You made it look easy. And I'm like, oh... And then, then we started talking. I'm like, who, who, who is this guy? And uh, and so I, that's how I was reintroduced to Paul. And next thing you know, I parked the motorhome at his house. We talked a little bit about um, training, and he told me a little bit about CISPA cycles. And bang, we're off and the, running. Yeah, the rest is history, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your uh, racing background. Well, I you know grew up in the Northwest. That's where I still live. It's my home. We trail rode as a, as a family. And that evolved quickly into going to the races. I did the NMA stuff in Washington and and rode qualifiers for the six day. Got super into the ISDE. I rode the six days three times when I was really young. And, and for those that don't know, the six days is the international six day enduro. It used to be the international six day trials. And it's sort of like what we call the Olympics of motorcycling. And it's teams from all different countries all over the world. And they compete in mostly, you know, kind of like uh, cross country. Sometimes we'll call them motocross special tests and things. But you've got to keep your own bike running and work on it over the course of six days. So, yeah. yeah, And and I started that, you know, portion of my career as a club rider, which would be the lower class of Americans that go. Only about 20 to 25 Americans go to six days. You have to qualify. I was on the junior trophy team, which was the fastest four guys under the age of 24 in, in Poland. And then I would say my my best ride at six days was in New Zealand. I was on the U.S. world trophy team, which is kind of the 
the fastest six guys in the country and they compete against all the other fastest six guys in, in all the other countries. And I got a gold medal in New Zealand. Uh, after that, I rode enduro cross. I kind of dabbled with national enduros. I did some GNCCs. I kind of bounced around just doing race to race. Uh, I, I went back to Washington and started kind of working the real day job thing. And I, I quit riding dirt bikes for four years. And it was, it was the best because I rode trials only for yeah, four you full you years. You didn't quit riding dirt bikes. I didn't bikes. quit riding completely. I quit you, riding big bikes. You and started practicing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, it, for sure. I got really into trials and, and was taught to ride trials by a phenomenal trials rider, Dennis Sweeten. And just rode trials and right and again so trials riding is a is a is and if you're not familiar it's a very specific discipline it's basically we'll call them like very small motorcycles without seats that do crazy stuff and you're not allowed to put your feet on the ground they do they do crazy stuff if you use the bike properly it, as a tool it's all about balance it's, it's all about traction it is the purest form of of riding to me. Uh, I went and rode what's called the Scottish six day trials, which is the oldest motorcycle competition in the world. And it was six days through Scotland on a trials bike. And instead of a speed event, it was these Creek beds and brutal water creeks steep. And, and I rode that and it was sort of really neat to go and, and be able to compete as a trials rider, not maybe an off road racer. And it's, it's all scored based on how much you do not put your foot on the ground. And no, you, you can't yeah. stop forward progress yeah, either. You, if yeah. you lose, if, if you, you if stop you moving, stop, yeah, yeah, they give you a five as yeah, well. And lose points. all the heroes were there, Dougie Lampkin. And it was a really, it was a really neat experience for me to go do that. Uh, after Scottish, I started riding dirt bikes again and rode at my... My, my house, my cabin in, in Cispus in, in Gifford Pinchot National Forest, started riding adventure bikes. I just sort of started doing as whatever I could ride, I would ride. And I, that's still how I am, am now. And then I met Jimmy at an adventure bike gathering and said I was teaching a little bit. And, and then, we boom. We, it's funny, we started talking about teaching and... I mean, I get it. Paul has all the racing accolades in the world. And I talk to lots of guys with tons of racing accolades and it doesn't mean that they can teach. And when I spoke to Paul, he kind of got it a lot better. And I, and I know it had to do with the trials background. And, and just because he, he all of a sudden balance was so much of a focus on what he was doing. And of course, if you're riding in the Pacific Northwest, actually a lot of places other than the desert traction is very very important like more so than what we would think and these are the two things we hinge a lot of our teaching principles on and we just kind of talked a little bit about you know some of the some of the the training because he wasn't he was you were very interested in like all these adventure riders like where where do they, where do these guys come from yeah I mean, yeah for and, sure because you have them all over the pacific yep. northwest you see them in your backyard they're just sleep. bombing just riding right by my cabin constantly and i yeah. go there's more people out riding adventure bikes and dual sports than than i even than i could really real yeah. realize because i'm racing you know and and like when i you know the chance that i've had to go to a lot of these different rallies over the years uh you you see that this group of riders, they're they're interested in going places and doing things, but a lot of times they don't come from this competition background that we've had, um, where you have to train and practice, and 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 we learn a lot of times from the school of hard knocks, and you get to be a good rider, and then it's like, well, how did you learn that, or what did you learn? And now, you know, through the training, the twenty years of training that that, that I've been doing, and the training that you've been doing in just the last few years, you see that it's like nobody, they never, they never got to crash and pick up their bikes a whole bunch of times, like kind of as a kid or for fun, or, yeah. or maybe they did that and they kind of forgot. Now they're on this big bike that you do not want to crash or have a bad time on. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I would see that. And I would see people really close to me. And this is where, when I started my school, they didn't have the freedom that I had on my motorcycle when they were, when we would go adventure bike riding and, and I would, these, these close people to me, I would say, let's go take that road or let's see where that goes or let's ride that trail. And it was always like, ah, I don't know. These bikes are heavy and they, they didn't have, all of a sudden I realized they didn't have the confidence or the freedom or, or even know what to do to turn your bike around or what if we run into this or what if we run into that? And I, I go, man, if I could 
teach some of that freedom by by bettering skills to these people, I it would that would be yeah. the most powerful and, thing. And so, what and what that is and what he's talking about is and and we jokingly say that to us all the bikes weigh the same. Like a big heavy venture bike weighs the same as my small dirt bike when everything is going just right. The minute stuff goes wrong, it starts going wrong. When my adventure bike is in balance, uh -huh. it's just as heavy as my they, KTM. They're and magical. To be honest with you, it's just as heavy as my trials bike. Right. But the minute it's not. It becomes very serious. And it goes up at an exponential level. Yeah. The consequences are high. And I think with training and, and understanding how we ride these different bikes or any bike for that matter, all of a sudden it unlocks all of this unknown, all these roads, all this terrain. Mm. And that is powerful for me to be able to teach. Yeah, and I think you would agree with me when I say that there is not a an adventure bike riding technique. You just respect the bike you're on. Yeah, yeah. I ride my adventure bike exactly like I ride my enduro bike. Right. You, you know, it's the same techniques, but, but I have to... I guess you're right. Respect the the weight of that bike. Respect what I'm doing. Respect the suspension travel and respect the consequences. Yeah. Of of that bike getting out of balance or or whatever you want to yeah, call dude, it. Yeah. And you know you can you you know just because it it looks like a an old time factory rally bike doesn't mean it acts like an old time yeah, factory rally bike. And, it's bit me and, a couple and, times. And, and 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 you you know you you load it up with luggage and all of a sudden it changes the dynamics about how the bike works. And one other thing that, that I like to point out and you you probably get this quite well too is that I actually think that the 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 big heavy adventure bike is in a lot of instances easier to ride because it it's harder to knock it out of balance. In other words, it kind of, if you're doing everything and get it in the, you know, you get it moving and get it going, it's not going to deflect. Or if you change your body or move it around, it doesn't move as quickly as your small little bike does. Yeah, it's more stable. It takes a little bit longer before you lose it. But once you do lose it, they're the best and, rider in the world can't get it back. Yeah, the, the strongest <laughs> rider in the world. There you go. The it. strongest rider in the world. I like that better. <laughs> the, 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 and the, the, the point of that is, is like people will say like, you guys kind of really push training on a smaller bike. Um, why do you, why is it so, you know, why do you always say the smaller bike? And I always say you tend to learn a lot more in the smaller bike because it tells you what you're doing a lot quicker. It reacts quicker and it doesn't mask your, your balance because you're, less of a portion of that balance you know the you know the, the uh, you're you're more of a portion of the balance on the smaller you can bike. recover a smaller bike a little quicker if you are out of balance and, right. you, and you don't just get these flop overs all day long like you do on the bigger bike the and, techniques are the same so it, so it is only a benefit yeah to train or, or practice or, or take a class even on a smaller bike it, it's it just makes it it makes it You'll learn, I would say you'll learn more and you're going to, you're try, we're trying to teach the rider. We're not trying to teach the bike. And that, that skill carries over to whatever two wheeled off-road bike you're on. hundred percent. That's, that's kind of our, our, uh, you know, philosophy on that. So kind of going back to that, the one other thing that was real interesting is when we started working together, Paul came out here and, and taught classes with me for, for a while. And we would do, uh, the one that really comes to mind is the way that I teach going over logs. Ah, here we go. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I know where we're going with this. So, yeah. Okay. So, so I, I, I really, really break it down in all these individual steps. And like, after I did the first one, Paul was just kind of standing there, you know, taking it in and he goes, dude, that's, that's like, that's way harder than like, if you just zap it and I go, okay, how do, how do, how do I zap Paul? And, and I'm, I, I want to get him to. Uh, I want you to teach me. How do, how do I zap? Uh, you, you've got me on this one because you're 100 percent right. I I watch this. Uh, but a, a zap, just, a, just so because a, a lot zap, of people. Don't okay, a zap me. is is a a high level maneuver that that a lot of people think they can do, but they can't. And it's it's the way we over a log or obstacle load the the suspension and time it at the at the right time and introduce power at the correct situation. And you actually unload the rear wheel and, and create lift and and effortlessly cross a log. It can be hanging in the air. And now that Jimmy's counting all this, it's a it's a very high level maneuver. Yeah, I think I got I think I got I, I want to say like five to seven. And they all have to happen intricate. within the, the most brief split moment right. together at the right time for this maneuver to work. Right. But, so, so just do that. Just zap it up there. Well, that's and, what I do. <laughs> I just zap it up there. And and in hindsight, 
without Jimmy's influence, I would have taught that or tried to teach that over and over and over again because it is what we do. You, you could, but I was setting you, my students up it, for failure. Well, you think about how you how you, how you, how you learned. It's just you watch somebody do it, and then you tried it, and you tried it, and you tried it, and you tried it, and, you, and for, then you, for you, days, weeks, months, and, you, and years, and you try to and you try to figure it out. And you and you had a lot of background. Before you even started trying it, I mean, you, you, so you're throttle and clutch. So, you know, the, the wheel loft portion of the zap. So the zap is essentially getting the bike to loft the front wheel and then tapping the front wheel on whatever create you're trying to create compression with the front wheel, yeah. which then and on, introduces an unload at the precise yeah, time load. It, it gives you additional traction because when you when you tap that all of a sudden it transfers all the weight when it lightens up on the front wheel, it transfers all the way to the rear wheel. And then you're doing stuff with the spring, the suspension. I mean, we're talking about crazy, crazy high level stuff. And it's like adventure rider right now. are going, I never want to do that. And it's like, mm, probably not. But wouldn't it be nice if you could. It's the best thing in the world yeah. if you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and unless I'm 100 percent confident that I can do this. I don't try it if there's a consequence. Like I'll try. It's funny. I'll I'll do this all day long on something that I know that if I go wrong, my front wheel is going to kind of bounce on it, and my skid plate's not going to land on it. Yeah, you, you know, because because here's the consequence: if if you if you if you kind of hit it and your front wheel doesn't roll, then you smack into it and uh. Or if you you manage to pop the front wheel over it and then you can press down and your skid skid plate hits it. <laughs> yeah, uh. or you drive the rear wheel into it or over it if your timing's wrong and and. The way that Jimmy teaches, which is which is step by step, it's it's like going from a dead stop to parking the front wheel up on the log, which is hard because you're yes, you, all of a sudden, especially if your seat height, you know, challenged, uh, you know, having a hard time touching the foot on the ground, it's really hard to go there. And on the adventure bikes, the seat's so far back compared to the gas tank, it's hard to put your feet on the log, and and you don't want to miss and go onto the skid plate and. Yeah, but it, what it does is it, it it starts all of the process and it and it, it slowly gets you over that log, and, but it, it's doing it in a controlled manner. And to just go in and, and teach an adventure rider or a dirt biker to zap, I feel like we have a lot of maybe not so confidence inspiring situations yeah, where so we're, we're a lot of falls. And, and the way that Jimmy taught me to teach this or teach in general is we just keep building and we keep building and we have a lot of success that way. Yeah. So we're taking an out of control situation and putting it into a controlled environment in the best way that we can. So something that's, that's, that's kind of nutty, but we're going to do it in a way that, that stuff shouldn't and isn't going to go wrong. So you can learn in, in these step buildings and then, and then when you do this, it very much points out that the problem isn't in not being able to do the zap. The problem is in maybe it's the timing and the coordination of one specific thing. Or oftentimes we see people getting ready to do something and they forget to stay balanced. Like they, or, they're, like they're ready to they're ready to go, and all of a sudden, or, leaning or what about side. what about this? They need to maintain a certain amount of speed to stay balanced. Right. And and for the zap, I mean we're hung up on a zap right now, but <laughs> for for some of the slower techniques, that speed can can wreck the timing. Yeah. So really it's a is it a speed problem? No, no. It's a balance problem because we're masking or using speed to stay in balance. And and then we're driving our wheels into that obstacle, which is traction. Yeah, oh yeah. It, we can geek the out two, on it so all the, day. But. So the, our fundamentals of our class, like we always say, there's two things that are super, super important in everything, and it's balance and traction. And they they factor in. The more balance you have, the more traction you get. And and generally, when you start losing traction, you're probably also out of balance. And then a motorcycle does four things. It will accelerate and decelerate, which in our idealized way of teaching, these are straight line activities. You want to accelerate and decelerate in straight lines. That's the most effective way to do it. And then you can initiate a turn and then control a turn. And if all of this kind of sounds like way too simplified or doesn't make sense or it's different than what you've heard before, that's why you come and see us. Because <laughs> uh, we'll take this and we'll take something that's ri ridiculously complex and break it down into these little, like, little elements like we just talked about. And we can teach you how to do the crazy advanced stuff quite easily. But we're going to point out that the problem isn't in what you think it is. It's in something else, which is one of the things I just described in the last yeah, I, minute or two. I agree with that completely. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so, how's it been going up there? And that you've got the most beautiful 
um, riding school. I mean, I like to say my classroom is beautiful, but it's just a different color. We're brown down here. Yeah, we are green for sure. Yeah. Uh, the mountains, the the trees, the moss, the ferns. What I can't. The rivers is just. It's yeah. the it's the best location to teach, and that's why I teach up there. Um, it's been going good. We don't do a lot of classes. Me and and Maria Forsberg is our other coach. And uh, if it stops being fun, like we get too many and we just crank them out, we're we 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 will stop doing it's them completely. The same thing we, is like we ride on the stoke. We we really like to see people improve exactly and, and, and enjoy and it. So our numbers for the amount of classes we do is probably on the low side of most schools, but I like it that way because it keeps us engaged. It keeps us excited. Yeah. And so we had a, the last class we taught was full class at the end of the year and everyone's loving it. And you guys, you guys go, it's kind of funny because we're opposite seasons here and we kind of start stopping shutting down because the heat here in June, you're, we're just, waiting for the snow to melt. You're just getting ready our, to get going. Our permitted routes in, in Gifford Pinchot are under snow, all the way until June, usually. Yeah. Right when I start thinking about the first class date, I, I go and see if we can get through some of the passes for our for our loops. And if if we can, I, I, I release the schedule, right? Yeah. So you're June through pretty much October. Yeah, I think yeah, well, I think we did one in October. I can't even remember. I think yeah. we did one in October so or the, September. We, but yeah. we always say those are our hotter months of the years and those are the ideal months of the year for you guys. Yep. And so it's and and you're you you've adapted what we teach out here for your uh, trail conditions and your your thing based on you know you, you guys it's like slightly different traction a lot more gravel roads um, a lot yeah more two track stuff yeah I I don't take groups out onto let's say big trail systems uh, it's not a good place to learn we don't have enough repetition right uh, so we're not bogging ourselves down we have these zones that that we teach and that we have permits for. And then at the end of the day, on day two, it's a two day program that I teach. We go on this big sort of payoff ride yeah. where we kind of tie everything together. We get to put some miles in, we get to see four four volcanoes, everyone's taking pictures and you we group to, you, up you and we talk about- Yeah, trail ride situations. You yep. say in this situation, this is what I would do. Yeah, and, you see, and, this and, is how we would do this. and. And we ride as a group. It's it has been very fun and very rewarding, really. And I'm pretty sure if you ask Paul to do crazy stuff on his uh, big adventure bike, he probably appease you. I suspect. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> within reason, right? I'm no Paul Terrace, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. nobody, nobody is exactly yeah. nobody is. Yeah, that that's that's like you talk about the years and years of practice. That's not just years. That's hours and hours and hours in those years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Plus, I think the guy's a man, man mountain of steel and muscle. Plus it's, all the balance. It's the perfect storm. <laughs> so, OK. Um, and you you probably also will be able to do start doing some private um, lessons and training in the near future. Yeah, I think I think this year for multiple reasons. Uh, I'm going to do some one on one, some small groups, some more specialized training. And what he's not talking about what he is, is Paul is working right now to go to the Dakar rally in 2023. So he's uh, he's on a massive fundraising campaign because <laughs> this is not it's a big challenge, especially to the pocketbook. I mean, Paul has all uh, plenty of skill to do it. He's actually out here working us uh, real heavy right now on navigation, learning all the navigation training, which is something else that we do um, in our, I guess, sp our spare time, right? Yeah, all, the, all our free time. <laughs> all our free time. And uh, but he's going to be doing some fundraising activities. And I'm sure you'll be able to see about this on CispusCycles.com. Yeah, and, and our social media. And follow, yeah, yeah, follow Paul at, on social. At Cispus Cycles Off-Road Training. Follow myself. You can follow Maria Forsberg. Jake Matier is our other coach up there we have three coaches our our classes are around 10 students i don't i don't get up into the 20 plus student range by any means we like to keep them small engaged we don't have you know a big flat giant dry lake bed for <laughs> for 20 people to be to be doing drills at and yeah. so it's a definitely a different vibe but i it's not better not not worse it's different is that 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it's, I like it's, that. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a totally different thing. And plus, if you're up in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Portland, you're over in the, you know, the yeah, we're, side of Washington. Yeah, I know you, you've been up there quite a bit of times, but we're two hours north of Portland yep. and two hours south of Seattle, right by Mount St. Helens. Yeah, so it's a it's a really ideal, and like I said, ideal, beautiful area. Um, there's pl plenty of places to camp around the facility. There is um, uh, lodging in. There's a little bit in Randall, maybe. Yeah, Not really. What's, we, what's the city? Packwood. Uh, Packwood. Packwood. It's about there. thirty minutes from where we teach or where we. If you if you need you know, to have a hotel. Yeah, right? <laughs> Packwood is. I, I like camping, but that's my style, right? Yeah. We're we're the. I'm the Mali Moto guy, so I like camping. Right. Uh, if yeah, you, Paul, Paul's definition of camping does not even register on the adventure <laughs> scale. It's more like I got stuck out in the trail and I'm just going to sleep here. That's yeah, all well, we're just going to curl up right here in the woods. <laughs> I wouldn't do that in the desert, though. This place is a it scares it's, you. It's the it's just different, and I'm I'm not my normal comfortable self. Yeah. out here. Want more creepy crawlies running around? Yeah, well, we got creepy crawlies. You just don't see them. Yeah, maybe so. You got to wear some of those night vision goggles, and you say, "What's all that stuff moving?" Around? Yeah, but but yeah, Packwood has got beautiful hotels and it's a little more touristy than where we are but like i said it's a it's a half an hour from where we start uh, our class each day and and end at the same time so yeah so at the end of each show we like to uh give away a little bit of a of a nugget something somebody somebody could practice uh at any time and it's been a while since we've done these so i've kind of forgot the ones that we did before uh, there was there was going to be a list evidently so i could kind of check them so off and figure them out so we don't go back we don't yeah this go is back. news to me it's, i feel like i'm well, that's that's why i was put on the spot right oh, now. I, you are going to get ah. put on the spot so i'm going to think it just if you if you could think of like one thing that that a rider could just go and practice um very easily uh what would what would that be like something that, that somebody would improve approve upon well i'm the trials guy right right and so slow is fast to me Okay. And you, you may have covered it because it is that important, but it's it's no different at, at my school. I would practice riding as slow and straight as possible in control. So you're saying just just pick a pick a straight line, mm -hmm. find something that's a nice straight line, clear in clear area with clearing around yeah, so you don't yeah. bump into stuff. Yeah, for sure. And try to go as slow as you can, yep. as straight as you can. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a good drill, a good tip. It there's a lot going on when you're going that slow. Can, you have clutch. You, you have can, can you, so okay. So you can go slower than you can go slow, slower. Yeah, first gear. Yeah, we're talking. The, you can always go slower right. until you're just in a track stopped. stand, right. like I would be uh, on. That, I to that, to I totally agree. That's one of the that's one of the first riding drills that we do at our schools. Is our you know we call it our slower than first gear drill. Yeah, but we add some other elements into it. There's a lot of different variations of it, but I think that's a. That's I a like to. Little I warm up with that kind of riding slow or, or, you know, slow race, you might even call it. Every, even if I'm doing a rally stage this week, we've been riding for eight days, I get on my bike and, and just see how slow I can go. I, it warms me up kind for, of. For me, it, it tells me how I'm doing that day like oh you know, you're hit that, or miss you're uh, oh i you know i'm getting older where i, I kind of watch <laughs> i have to watch my uh my mojo and so sometimes i hop on and i'll do this little thing i'll go do the slow slow thing and i'm going yeah gotta be careful today <laughs> yeah. so so with that thank you paul for uh joining us on the podcast i'm sure we're gonna have you many more times we'll probably have to do a little more zoom meetings or uh, i'll have to come up and visit you with my uh, camera or something yeah yeah and uh and I'm sure your daughter will wonder what a podcast was after she watched Daddy on the show, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that was the last question. What's a podcast? What's a podcast? I, I don't really know. <laughs> well, you just did yeah. one. Well, so, I like it. Thank so you for we're... having me on. And thanks for for everything we do. Thanks for yeah. no, the, the navigation training this week. Thank yeah, you. I'm, uh, it's good. I'm stoked. I'm stoked to have you as part of the team. It's a it's a real quality addition to a, to our program. And the, the, the knowledge that you bring back, you know, like I said, we're – as coaches, we're always learning more from our students and from our other coaches and stuff. And we're, we're teach we teach each other. We challenge each other with these, hey, how would you fix this problem? Yeah, this so, happened and I did this. What, what would you have done? Yeah, I, I kind of like that. It's pretty good. So anyways, so, with that, we will uh, wrap this episode up and uh, hopefully we'll see you at one of our schools, see you at CISPA Cycles Off-Road Training uh, during the summer and JLR Off-Road Training during the winter. And uh, we will see you out on the trail. So cool. cheers. Awesome. Thanks, guys.